Okay, good morning. Sorry about that. <laughs> I hope you're excited to be here as I am. It is a beautiful day, and it is a beautiful opportunity that we have to gather with God's people and worship together. And I'm happy to be here, and I hope you are too. We've had a lot of things going on here recently in the congregation. Just last night, we had our annual senior appreciation dinner at Bianchi's in Cynthiana. Had about 35 people there, and we had a great time. Uh, and we appreciate so much our seniors, and that was a great way, I think, to show that. We've also got a, a new event Coming up tomorrow, we're going to be having our first ever trunk or treat here at the Parish Church of Christ from 4 to 6, and I hope that you've made plans to participate in that. I appreciate everyone who's already contributed to the candy bucket in the foyer, and that will help uh, to stock the trunks for the trunk or treaters. And so uh, we're excited about that also. Um, I want to say once again to the guests in our presence, we're so glad that you're here. If you've not already done so, please take a card from the pew in front of you and fill that out. Uh, let us know of any way that we can be of service to you. And place that card in the uh, collection plate as it goes by later. That is your offering today. Members, you know to fill out the other side of that card and to put any announcements or prayer requests on the card. Today is a special day. Not just because it is the Lord's Day, and, but also because it is a friends and family day. Every fifth Sunday we try to do this and we're excited for these opportunities to share with one another. We're going to have a meal after the service today and I hope that you've made plans to join us for that meal downstairs. And you'll also get to see some of the improvements that are being made uh, to the fellowship hall. But since it is a friends and family day, I thought it would be a nice idea to introduce the Paris Church of Christ. For some of us, this is going to be a reminder, and for others of us, it may be some new information, but I hope that for all of us, it's beneficial. Introductions are important. First impressions are important. You know what they say, first impressions, you can only make one. And so we hope that it's a good one today. But when I think about introductions, about meeting someone for the first time and finding out about who they are, my mind goes back to the great Civil War drama, Gone with the Wind. Perhaps you're familiar with this story, or perhaps not, but the main character, Scarlett O'Hara, is the daughter of a wealthy landowner in southern Georgia, and she is in love with the neighboring farm's inheritor, Ashley Wilkes. But there's one problem. Ashley is engaged to his cousin, Melanie, as is the tradition in their family. And so he is not available to Scarlett. And so Scarlett gets this idea, they're going to have a big barbecue on the Wilkes farm like they do every year, and she's going to declare her undying love to Ashley. And so the big day comes, and the barbecue is raging, and Scarlett finds an opportunity to pull Ashley aside in the parlor, and she begins to tell him that they belong together. And Ashley's a very practical man, very traditionally. He lets Scarlett know in no uncertain terms that he is going to marry his cousin Melanie and that she just needs to move on. Scarlett doesn't take that very well. She's got a kind of a hot temper and she begins to hurl insults at Ashley and she begins to, um, to say all kinds of demeaning things and eventually she gets so angry that she throws a porcelain figure at the wall and Ashley leaves the room. And it's only then that we find out that throughout all of this, a mysterious man by the name of Rhett Butler has been trying to take a nap on the couch in the parlor. And he has heard all of this take place. And Rhett Butler, the man that he is, begins to make fun of Scarlett, whom he has never met. And things come to a head when Scarlett says to Rhett, You, sir, are no gentleman. To which Rhett replies, And you, miss, are no lady. <laughs> Introductions. First impressions. They're really important. We all want to make a good one. 
And sometimes we don't really even recognize the impression that we're leaving. But this morning, I want to briefly introduce the Paris Church of Christ by asking three questions. And the first one is, who are we? Who are we at the Paris Church of Christ? And I could give you a number of possible answers to that question, but the very first thing that came to my mind is that we're a family. And this is true in a number of different ways. But first and foremost, it's true in a spiritual sense. If you've got your Bibles and you'd like to open up, we're going to read from John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13 in just a moment. Because here at the Paris Church of Christ, every person who has placed membership, who has decided to be under the oversight of these elders, has demonstrated that we are part of God's spiritual family. In John chapter 1, John is introducing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And he says in verse 12, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. We believe that to be part of the family of God, we've got to be born again through Jesus Christ. And every person who's a part of this congregation has done just that. They've been born again through Jesus Christ. And so we are a family in a spiritual sense. We're a family. But we're also a family in a practical sense. What I mean by that is like any family, we love each other, we care for each other, and we have challenges and struggles. We talked about some of that in the Bible class this morning. How the, the nation of Edom descended from Esau and the nation of Israel descended from Jacob. They had their challenges. But as a family, we have a commitment to work through those challenges. To work with each other. To bear with one another. And as a family, we do take care of each other. We enjoy spending time together in fellowship just like we did last night at Bianchi's. Like we're going to do hopefully in a few moments when we have our lunch. But as a family, we also go through the difficult things together. We mourn together. We help each other out when something needs to be done. We take special projects like splitting wood or lifting up a garage onto railroad ties because we're a family. We're a family spiritually, but we're also a family very much in the practical sense. And this is important because we all need family that we can rely on. But we're also a community. We're a community in that everyone contributes so that all can receive a greater benefit. Everyone contributes so that all can receive a greater benefit. This is true in a number of senses. It's true in the fact that here when we gather to worship, we all bring something to offer. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 26, this is what Paul writes to the church in Corinth. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. We're a community in that we've all contributed to build one another up. And that's true this morning in this worship service as we've already been led and seen by Brother Cecil as Sid read in the Scripture and led us in prayer. And those men have led us, but we've all been participating. We've all been contributing to this worship service. And what a blessing it is to be a part of that community. You know, I like to sing. Sometimes if you were a fly on the wall here in the office, you might find that for seemingly no reason, I will have burst out into song. But you know what's special is when we all get to sing together. When we all lend our voices. And that's what a community is. And so we're a community in that we worship together. But we're also a community in that we've all got unique talents and gifts that we bring to the table and that we offer for the good of all. You know, we're a community in the fact that Barry Blevins comes up here and mows this yard faithfully. And we're a community in the fact that Phyllis Ross 
sends birthday cards and anniversary cards and get well cards. And we're a community in the fact that Shirley and Lucille send bulletins even to those who've moved away from us. And in the fact that Rodney is always making sure that the attendance cards are picked up. And Ronnie is here throughout the week making sure that the building is clean. And we're a community in the fact that we reach into the greater Paris community in a number of ways, including especially through our food pantry. And we've got a number of members who are so involved in that and make it look like it's so easy. Henry and Kathy and Joe and Vicki. We're a community. And time would not permit for me to say all of the ways that everyone here contributes to this community. But we all contribute so that all of us can gain more than what we could if we were doing it all by ourselves. So the Paris Church of Christ is a family. We're a community. Well, I'm having trouble with this thing today. And we're also a congregation that belongs to Christ. Now that's even in our name. And allow me to say something about that for just a moment. Paris Church of Christ is not so much of a name as it is a description. And what I mean by that is this is a group of people in Paris, Kentucky who collectively belong to Jesus Christ. Okay, where's my amen corner? We are a group of people in Paris, Kentucky who belong to Jesus Christ. And what that means, first of all, is that, as we've already stated, everyone who is a part of this congregation has been born into the family of God through Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 20, Paul is meeting with the elders from the church in Ephesus. He's called them to Miletus because he's on a journey and he can't go all the way to Ephesus, but he has some important things to say to these men who lead that congregation in Ephesus. And in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, he says this, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. The church belongs to God. He bought it with the blood of Jesus Christ. He bought each and every one of us individually with the blood of Jesus Christ. And when we're washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, we become part of His church and part of His family. And what that means is, above all, that this church does not belong to any one of us. It belongs to Jesus Christ. And because it belongs to Jesus Christ, He is the head of this church. He makes the decisions for this church and he's laid them forth in his word he sets the vision and the goals and the emphasis of this congregation and so we are a congregation that belongs to him and he is our head you know that means we don't have an earthly headquarters because our head is not on earth he is in heaven and we'll talk about that some more in just a little bit but this also means that because this church belongs to Christ we emphasize and teach the things that he emphasized and taught. And that means that we emphasize and teach the necessity of evangelism. Just as Christ commanded that we go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to every creature. It also means that we emphasize and teach caring for the needy. Because Christ taught that as well. And it also means that we believe in a strong personal morality just as Jesus taught morality for every individual in the Sermon on the Mount. This is a church that is striving to the best of our ability to belong to Jesus Christ. And so we are the Paris Church of Christ, not as an official title, but as a description of who we are. Well, what do we believe? We're a church. We're not a civic club. We're not a glee club. We're a church, and that means that we must have strong foundations and beliefs. And I could tell you a number of different things that we believe, but I've done my best in this brief time to distill them into the most important things. And the first one is this. We believe that the Bible is God's Word. Now, of course, that means already that we believe in God, but I think that's already made clear in the things that have been said. But we believe that the Bible is God's Word. 
And because the Bible is God's word, it is his full message to us. This is what Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. You notice that word complete? The Bible is everything that we need to live life on this earth in a way that pleases God. And we believe that, and we teach that here, and I hope that that's clear in the things that have already been said and the things that will be said. You know, the Bible is a special book. It contains accurate historical records, but it's not a history book. It contains accurate scientific references, but it's not a science book. The Bible is God's full message for humans. It tells us everything that we need to know to live life on this earth in a way that is pleasing to God. It's not a history book. It's not a science book. It's a life-giving book. And we believe that here. And this means that we do things here at the Parish Church of Christ perhaps a little bit differently than you may have seen elsewhere. To the very best of our ability, we are living the simple truth of this word. And that means that we meet every first day of the week. And it also means that every first day of the week, we partake of the Lord's Supper. Because that's what we see being done in the New Testament. It also means that, you may have noticed, we worship without instruments. Because we cannot find any example of using instruments in worship in our New Testament. And it also means that this church is organized according to the pattern of the New Testament. I'm not a pastor. A pastor is someone who shepherds or oversees. And we've got three good men who are our elders. They are our shepherds. They are our overseers. And that's according to the pattern of the New Testament. And of course, the chief shepherd and overseer of this church, as we've already stated, is Jesus Christ. We don't do these things because we want to stand out. We don't do them because we're contrarian or we want to be different from everyone else. We do things in this way because insofar as we have found the Scripture to be true, this is what we see being done there. This is what we see being done in the Scripture. And we simply want to do what the Bible says. And so here at the Parish Church of Christ, we believe that the Bible is God's Word. We also believe that salvation comes through Jesus Christ alone. We believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we believe that the only way that we can come into a right fellowship with God is through Jesus Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, He died for the sins of all people. And because He died for all people, we must come to God through Him. The only way that we can come into a right relationship with God is through Jesus Christ. Through fellowship that we have through Jesus with the Father and the Spirit. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John have been brought before the council of the Jews. And Peter makes this most beautiful statement in verses 11 and 12. He says, This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There's only one way that we can come to God the Father today, and that is through Jesus Christ. This we teach and believe. And we also believe this. We believe that Christ has only one church. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 16, Peter makes the confession that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Christ. That means He is the fulfillment of Old Testament promise and prophecy. And based upon that confession in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, Jesus declares that He will build His church. And He promises to build a church. A church that can withstand the assaults of hell. But he doesn't promise to build many churches. He promises to build one. Now I need to be clear here. Because there are many congregations mentioned even in our New Testament. And so what do we mean by church? Well we mean basically that when Jesus died, he died for one people. And they may come from many different congregations throughout time. 
and throughout space, but they must all unite under Jesus Christ and they must obey Him. And we'll talk about that more in just a moment. Jesus died for one church and He gave the authority to begin that church to His apostles and He promised them that He would send them the Holy Spirit. And on the day of Pentecost, they got up, endued with the power of the Holy Spirit, and they preached the first gospel sermon. And on that day, many thousands believed in Jesus Christ. They turned from their life of sin, and they were buried in the waters of baptism for the forgiveness of those sins, rising to walk a new life in Jesus Christ, and the church was born. And we believe that that's by the authority of God given to Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit on that day. And maybe you've heard about something called the Restoration Movement. Here in Bourbon County, there is a meeting house out off Cane Ridge Road known as the Cane Ridge Meeting House. And it's a historic landmark of the American Restoration Movement. Well, the Restoration Movement doesn't belong to America or Bourbon County. But it is the basic idea that insofar as we are able we should look like the church that was born in Acts chapter 2. That's the restoration ideal. And what that means is, to the best of our ability, we believe what the Christians in Acts chapter 2 believed. We teach what they taught. We worship the way that they worshipped. And we do the things that they did as a matter of faith. That is, the good works of the Christian life. And the reason for this, there are actually s several reasons we could give, but I want to give three. First of all, we believe that this is pleasing to God. God designed the church that we see in Acts chapter 2, that we see being led by the apostles throughout the New Testament. <clears throat> so we believe that it is most pleasing to God when we follow that pattern. We also believe that this gives Christ his due honor and glory because he is the one who promised the Holy Spirit to the apostles on that day. And the preaching that they had was Christ-centered preaching. But we also believe that this is our very best opportunity to be united as believers in Jesus Christ. You know, there are many denominations today teaching many different things, believing many different things. But the basic plea that we have is that we should go back to the scriptures and do and believe and teach what they do believe and teach that's simple we believe that that strips away all of the man-made things it's not that we're against instruments for example in practice in, in thinking that they are immoral things I have a guitar at my house but we believe that this is our very best chance to take Christianity back to its essence, back to its simplicity. And in its simplicity, we can be united in the truth. Just like we read from Ephesians chapter 4 this morning. Those basic things in Ephesians 4, 4 through 6 are ways that we can be united. Well, why does all of this matter? Well, I think there are two main reasons that I'd like to share with you this morning and then the lesson will be yours. And the first is this, God is glorified. When we are the church that he designed, when we teach, believe, and practice the things that we've been instructed to, the glory is not given to us. It's not something that we have made. It's not something that we have designed. It's not something that we have planned. It's something that comes from God and it gives glory to him. In Ephesians chapter 3, Paul is giving a prayer for the church in Ephesus. And he concludes that prayer in verses 20 and 21 with what we might call a doxology. And he says this, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the great power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. When the church submits to and obeys God when we believe in Jesus Christ and we believe in this word and we obey it when we do the things that we've been called to do as a community and a family and a congregation within and without God is glorified 
And that's according to his design. And so that's why we're here. That's why the Paris Church of Christ exists. First and foremost, above all else, to give glory to God. But right along with that is this. We believe that when all of these things are as they should be, that lives are transformed. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 19, this is what we read. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. When we participate in those things that we've discussed this morning, when we're born again through Jesus Christ, we're made new. The old passes away. The sin and the doubt, the guilt, all of that is taken away when we're washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean that life for Christians is going to be simple or easy, but it means that we now have a rock to lean upon that is much bigger and greater than we are. But also when the church functions as it should, not only are the members already transformed, but we are reaching out to the community around us with the truth of Jesus Christ that transforms and with the love of Jesus Christ that transforms through the evangelism that takes place and also through the compassionate care that we provide. And so, as a church, we give glory to God. And as a church, when we function as we should, lives are transformed. And this also is for the glory of God. So who is the Parish Church of Christ? Well, we're a family. We're a community. We're a congregation that belongs to Jesus Christ. We teach and believe the simple message of God's Word. And we do so for the glory of God. And because we know without a shadow of a doubt that lives are transformed when we do this. And so today, I hope that our first impression hasn't been a bad one. I hope that we've been reminded of the important identity that we have as a congregation in Jesus Christ. And today the Lord invites all who are not already part of his one body, the church, to come to him through Jesus Christ. Just like those on Pentecost did, believing that he is the Christ, turning from your life of sin, confessing his name, being buried in the waters of baptism for the forgiveness of sins. You rise to walk a new life. You're part of God's one church, and we'd love for you to make your local membership here in Paris. Or if you're already a Christian, and you need the prayers and encouragement of your church family, this invitation is for you as well as we stand and sing together.